Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Robert and Lela. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. Communication skills are crucial for your career growth and leadership development. And by the end of this episode, please log on to Apple and Spotify, leave us a rating and a review and what you'd like for us to discuss on this podcast that will be of benefit to you. Now let's get communicating with Patrick Mulaki, hailing all the way from the UK. He is a learning and leadership professional from scale-up and startup environments. And before I go any further, please help me welcome him to the show. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Roberta. Great to speak to you. How are you today? You good? I'm doing fantastic. How are things over there? They're good. Just to manage expectations and apologies in advance. If you hear barking in the in the background in the other room, that's our dog. It, I'm, I'm at home as we record this. I've got a wife and son asleep upstairs. I've got a dog that should be asleep in the back room, but might be set off by foxes in our back garden or something like that. So don't worry if you hear like shouting or barking. It's nothing, nothing alarming. Uh, but yeah, it's great to be here and, and great to be you and, and your audience as well. Thank you for being here. Do you think the draw the dog might be eavesdropping on our conversation? I don't know. She Kara is her name, and like she mm. does just appear out of the blue on occasion. I've had it when I've been running workshops and stuff virtually, and just there's something sets her off. Whether it's like the we've got building work going on next door, or there's a post man or woman delivering something, and you're like, this is not ideal, but I got to work for it. But um. She's a character. So yeah, maybe we'll get a, a wonderful appearance at some point. I hope not. Um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you so much. So give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a learning leadership professional. What does that mean exactly? So I design, deliver, create learning experiences, curriculums, um, resources for working professionals. Um Originally, I started out in more corporate environments, uh, and originally I started out as a HR generalist before moving into more formal L&D, and gradually have moved into sort of in between tech teams, digital learning, through to most recently, scale up and startup environments. Um, more broadly, uh, just someone who's very passionate about learning in the workplace and organizations and how they benefit you know commercial realities but also individuals in terms of realizing their potential and and everything they do in in, in their own space and work lives as well and i'm a strong believer um around bringing your authentic self to work and so much of what we do in terms of professional growth and development is actually not just about you know the job we do but actually our calling and career as well so that's a little bit of an overview of me and like you said based out of the uk but works internationally across the eu and, and clients and organizations in the us and beyond um but yeah so that, that that's me in, in a nutshell and of all the careers you could have chosen why learning and development so good question so i think it's based on a mistake frankly so when i first came out of university i remember thinking very deliberately I want to be in a role that gets me around people, that gets me involved in whatever the notion of a people element is in an organization. And without having a clue of the reality of what a HR function was, I was like, that's it. That's what everyone keeps telling me is the people function. Now, that is notionally correct, but I don't mind saying I talk about a lot now. I was kind of on that career ladder of like HR advisor going into HR BP. I was like a HR officer was my last role in HR. I was not suited to that kind of work at all. And it was only when I started doing some studies, some formal studies that I actually realized, wow, the learning and coaching, the learning design and delivery, actually, this doesn't feel like hard work. The effort I put into studying those kind of aspects, this actually feels like I'm in a state of flow. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was. And so I was just drawn to that. And within, I'd say a year or so of kind of getting exposed to that in my like formal studies when I was still working in the HR field, I decided I've got to go full time into a learning development role. And in about three or four months after that decision, I was delivering workshops um, in the UK and then flying out to the UAE not long after to deliver my first stuff overseas. So 
it all happened pretty quickly after that but um once i landed in learning the thing i love about it and still love about it now over 10 years later is it's solution focused when you're having conversations with teams individual leaders it's more often than not they're looking to change something for the better for themselves or the people they work with it's not a uh how to put it it's not like a correction it's just trying to realize an opportunity of people's potential again um, and that's what i love about it so it's it's always creative it's always full of great ideas you never know where it's going to take you um and i really enjoy it mm. how do you identify and package the problem and then decide okay we need to find the solution for this so let's have a course facilitate something in order to get this solved yeah this is a great question and the there's this historical connotation when i first started working in the people space and it's still present to a certain degree is you have managers or senior leaders say i'll just throw a topic out there at random my people need to be, get better at presentation skills or mm-hmm. they need to get better at um sales skills and it's actually based on a perception and an assumption around their own understanding of the problem. So more often than not, half the role and, and the work I'm doing is trying to explore and do some discovery work by saying to leaders, actually, that's fantastic. You've got a notion, an idea of what a, we'll use the word problem, might be or an opportunity to change something in your team. But have you actually, what's your metrics? What's your measures to actually validate your assumption? And that's when we kind of pivot a little bit, or, or I try to anyway, to say, well, can we talk to the people who are actually at the cold face of this, who are involved with the challenges you're exploring or expecting to explore in the coming months? What's their lived reality? Um, and more often than not, that's where you get the dynamic and start. It's almost like a blank map you have up to that point, and then you start to kind of fill some coordinates in. Once you speak to people who actually are faced with reality or the challenges of trying to improve their own performance or improve certain skill sets. That's where you get the the real nub of what a problem or opportunity is in an organization. Um, I, I, I strongly believe a lot of organizations actually have um, good intent, but either a lack of good data or perception or poor assumptions around actually what some of the challenges their teams face. And to, to build on your question as well, to in terms of solutions like what informs like different solutions a lot of the time actually it's a case of communicating more effectively in organizations being more deliberate around okay do people understand what resources or support are in different places or even different processes to actually realize oh this isn't a um education piece per se it's actually a comprehension and realizing where is that process or tool when it's needed just in time rather than forcing someone to be sheep dipped into a workshop or a module online, wherever it might be. Um, so there's a bit of a tangent. Does that help a little bit though around kind of like mm. when we explore problems and build out solutions? Yes, because as you said, you know, sometimes leaders have an idea, but it's not exactly the right diagnosis for the problem, mm. which then brings the question of, are team members able to clearly communicate what they need I and think... articulate it well enough for the leader to know that, okay, you need to go and learn the skill or go to this course because I understand exactly what your problem is based on yeah. what you said. Yeah. I think that's when you get into a, a, a wonderful layer of human dynamics then as well, because some of that, what comes out of those kind of conversations is actually, well, what is the team comfortable surfacing or sharing with their of the individuals they're being managed and led by? Because there could be some stones you pick up. And this is where it gets interesting being a learning professional. You're like that third party who's neutral. And it's kind of like, hey, no returns, no, no, like, you know, Vegas rules or Chatham House rules, as we sometimes say in the UK. There's going to be no issue of anything you say here. But like, what's what's I've got some symptoms, but what's the cause of your challenges or issue here? Let's talk it through. And then that kind of feeds into, again, around validating assumptions. And and you might have a brief from a senior leader, but it's always telling is around, if you say, for example, that there's an urgency to move or, or have an output, let's just use a workshop. It's a classic example of like, mm-hmm. I want my people to go through or experience a workshop. Great. 
how are you going to measure or validate what they're doing differently or as a result? What's the behaviors or the changes you expect to see in, in the following two to six weeks? If, if you're absolutely wedded to it, sometimes it's like, don't know, don't care. Just, just, I just want the, I have a, an outcome or action bias is like, okay. Oh, fine. spend the budget. They said we must spend the training exactly. budget. Exactly. And I understand as well, there's some optics and politics to some of this. Every mm. organization has its own microculture and, and dynamics that are going on. But it's those individuals willing to ask those questions who often will find those innovations and ideas at source around actually we can become more efficient or do or deliver a service better by being thoughtful around this stuff and asking deliberate questions around it. And then if you're able, from the learning side as well, as a learning professional, if someone's listening to this or someone in the people space, if you're able to resolve for a problem a team didn't even realize they had and then hand them back budget, resource, or time that they didn't use up um, and waste, it actually really helps build trust in terms of your role as being an honest broker and say, look, I'm happy to facil facilitate in, in the most general terms of that mm -hmm. word facilitate creating a solution but actually let's create one for a problem that's a, a reality for your team um that sounds all very i suppose kind of generic to a degree but it is the reality i find of um like i say organizations and team leaders they often there's a, there's a, a bias towards action without perhaps having a bias or a preference towards testing their own assumptions and the final thing i just throw in on that is um i'm guilty of it as well in terms of i've I must think, oh, a solution or this approach has worked elsewhere. This this set of st stakeholders, their personas, this would be a great match for what I see or believe. Um, and you've got to temper that. And that's as well what I see in managers and leaders is their own experience when they were more junior, perhaps, or they had a really positive experience or you know, a massive uptick in terms of their development, their career they project and that kind of unconscious bias around like projecting what the actual solution is to a problem that really doesn't need it. It's, it's common and it's all good intent, but you've really got to measure and manage that kind of intent against actually, is this valid? Is this useful? And is this going to deliver the change and, and things we need to see differently? Mm, otherwise it's a waste of money and time. Exactly. You also deal in psychometrics and a little some bit, of yeah. A, l oh, a little bit. Okay. So is, yeah. it, is it okay Let's if I ask you a question it, no, about absolutely. it? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we wonder when it comes to psychometric testing. One, are you testing to see if I should work for this organization to, be to begin with? And are you testing to see if I do get hired by this organization? Am I going to be placed in the right position based on the psychometric evaluation? Yeah. So I would say... Um... For any psychometrics, a couple of caveats. First is, it's a snapshot for a moment in time. So often, like, when I'm setting one up for some of the ones I'm accredited in, like, mm -hmm. we do, like, the disclaimer in terms of the comms or before people complete the paperwork. So, look, be conscious of where you're just coming from <laughs> before you complete this. I, If you had a bad day, if you've had a dramatic or or not being too over the top a traumatic incident prior to um you know a completing that kind of documentation it will cast a shadow over what your response your emotion your feeling is towards it um I had it years ago where um this is a slight tangent but where a candidate turned up for a job interview after seeing an accident on the train on the london undergrounds on the way to work and they become so focused on the process that they were like, oh, no, I want to do this. I want to be here. And we were like, how can you like this? This is not fair on yourself or, or anyone like kind of give yourself the space and time to do that and just kind of just step away. Um, so I'd always say that in the context of psychometrics. One thing I would say is um, managers often, and this feeds in a little bit to what we talked about a moment ago, is like, I want person A, B, C for problem or skill set X, Y, Z, which I need in my team. What you've got to keep in mind is, um, you know, job descriptions and specifications are there to try and act as criteria to assess someone's ability to perform in the role. Psychometrics are more about looking at your preferences. I, if I use myself as an example, if I really had to, if I really wanted to, 
I might be able to carve out a career in financial services. I don't think I'd be very good at it for, for, for very, you know, it would take years. My brother, on the other hand, has a great career in financial services because he has a preference for more of that data-led introversion, detail oriented Whereas me, I'm big vision, big ideas, extroversion. Those are our separate preferences. But in terms of intellects, work ethic, debatable, the work ethic maybe, but like in terms of intellect, we're not that far apart, but preference wise, we're in very different spaces. And that's what psychometrics, I believe, like I would say they can shine a light on someone's preferences in terms of a work dynamic, a culture, in terms of how a team operates and where that individual might fit in. It's why I'd always say I, I'd be cautious around use. I'm very cautious around using them for recruitment purposes. I've personally mm -hmm. never used them. I've used them in the space of say, say team building or team coaching and dynamics or one-to-one -one coaching for people who are curious to use them um and the other thing i'd say is um they're not binary on a scale so i use the introversion and extroversion as like joking comparison my brother and me if you put us diff in different social scenarios our behaviors will change around who we're around what are we observe our own roles to be what we observe others to be their roles socially so for example um if you were to for anyone listening to this now if you go to a bar on a friday night with some friends and just grab some dinner and drinks the way you behave and arrive might be quite different if say you went to a bar and we're going to dinner and drinks with your ceo for a professional meeting for whatever reason like i don't know why you'd be going on a friday night for dinner and the drinks <laughs> so, yeah no, no, it's not a fun friday night let's be honest but yeah. um the dynamics change even though you as a person you you're still the same person but you're observed and and kind of i suppose um observed role in that scenario and and your behaviors from it Will change and that's where psychometrics be interesting because they can shine light around okay wait in certain instances your responses have shown that you have a preference toward this aspect in this context of the psychometric versus say this other competing aspect but again i'd say that's where it comes back to it's important about the mindset and frame you come to with the questions mm -hmm. that you're looking at and completing and then the person assessing it or teams using it for whatever purpose they, they realize it's not going to be fixed. So for example, um, the psychometrics I've done for myself, my own profile, radical changes over a period of four to five years, just because you go through life, you go through different life events right. and it informs your own behavior. So, yeah. Mm, yeah. You spoke about organizational culture. And one thing you've said is you, do you help leaders nurture organizational culture? I think I like to think so, but I, I I always I suppose cultures culture is so fluid and culture really is it's not owned by a leader or, or one individual. It's a collective thing. It's a, it's about the behavior of the collective and with the way I like to bucket it. It's like kind of behaviors or actions you want to encourage, behaviors or actions you accept, and behaviors and actions you ignore. So at all ends of the spectrum. So. Um, I always like to think about the teams I've worked with, the projects I've worked on, we've looked at amplify the behaviors we encourage and we accept around kind of what does high performing look like? What is a good, I suppose, role model in terms of respective organizations, culture and values look like? Um, and I'd always say to, you know, leaders, you can set the tone. Your leadership shadow is long. Um, and so you can set the tone in terms of, how and what people believe is the floor for the right sort of behavior. It's up to them to help you push the ceiling a little bit in terms of where you take that, but you set the floor and it's up to you whether it's a floor that everyone feels solid on, really clear about what's accepted norms and behaviors and what's encouraged, or it's up to you to like create some smoke and mirrors around that. If you're inconsistent, if you're not um, measuring or prioritizing the right things, if you're not perhaps say showing up in the right ways in terms of how you communicate and operate and lead your teams, that's kind of making a floor that's more like, I suppose, a uh, carousel at times It's going up and down where you, where you want to create something more solid. So the stuff, the work at the projects and the content the stuff I work on, there's focusing a lot around that culture piece and helping leaders in that space. 
Um, but as well, the nuts and bolts of around what does a good manager, a good leader look like as well, the more practical aspects. Because um, what I find is actually organizations, especially with first time managers and leaders, they've got great intent, really positive mm. intent. But sometimes it's just they lack either the confidence or the lived experience of having done the more practical aspects, say around mid-year, end-of-year processes, dealing with challenging employees, dealing with employees who need raw resource and support who they can see of high potential. Um, and that's difficult because process can be understood, but people, you have to experience it and you have to live through it a little bit. It's kind Constant of, moving targets we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the beauty of it as well. Um, I, I joke about it because it's just kind of the organization of working have like a recently we've had a tech focus it's like if you're coding you can look at a website app and say hey is the output of this what we're coding is, is that a bug or a feature is that something we need to fix or is that something a feature that we want to keep and amplify people don't work like that where it's just like okay look can i just kind of take a Cut, like coding count on that person like is today a bug or a feature day for patrick do we need to like manage him or it, it's just a moment in time and there's so much that goes into it um and it's so fluid which is the frustrating but also the appealing aspect of it as well mm, yes that's why you have people who love working with people because of the dynamic constantly changing and they just say i like my certainty please keep me away from people i just want to do my job I don't respect um, both. I respect both. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, when it comes to learning, obviously, we, we always say it's more, it's not instruction and you're just standing in the front and teaching, but mm. facilitation people's learning or mm. facilitating people's learning. What would you say to that? Yeah. So again, like I grew up, to give you people a timeline, I grew up in like, uh how do i gloss over this uh without embarrassing myself i was coming up like as a, as a child during the late 80s early 90s and entering the world of i was born in the 70s what are you embarrassed about i just i don't know i don't know I don't, i've reached a certain <laughs> point of 42 now where i feel like oh god 47 well, you complaining about? oh my god it's, oh dear why am i getting hung up on this anyway um when i was like if i was coming up in terms of when I was coming through secondary school, then when I went to university in terms of those formal education environments as a point of reference, mm. we have this saying in the UK and, and I think more widely, the notion of the sage on the stage. Uh, picture a lecture hall with a lecturer at the front with the knowledge, the input presenting at you. And it's almost like you learn by rote and consumption and just being there, being present and not actually necessarily learning independent thought skills or critical thinking skills what has changed or i've seen change and i'm i'm grateful for the change it's what's drawn me to the industry this space is around actually the notion of facilitating conversations uh, interactions and drawing from the people that back in in my in my youth would have been just presented at now actually they're the authors of their own experience and their own learning so for example any workshop or content I run with a virtual in person, they might say like be let's pick a number out like three or four hours of a session for just for argument's sake. There could be only like five or six slides covering up some key models or frameworks within that delivery. But within that, there's a lot of blank space and time where it's conversation led based on actually, well, what is this group here for? What's the commercial value or change you want to get from this? What's the thing you want to do differently as a result of being together? I'm coincidental in some ways. I will facilitate aspects of the structure and stuff we've got to get through. What's more of more value is actually you sharing your own ideas, testing your own assumptions, iterating with your colleagues in a community of practice. Um, that's for me what facilitation good facilitation looks like connecting and helping people curate their own experiences um the only thing i'd throw in on top of that though is um when we talked sort of past a little bit this around this earlier was um what goes into like good learning design i think and delivery is a sense of jeopardy as well mm. and what i mean by that is um you know people can if they, if they want to read a handout or if they want to go watch a recorded webinar or something, they can do that. Don't just give them a passive experience. Give them something that's actually engaging and give them a sense of jeopardy, therefore by giving them a chance to put into practice what you're discussing. 
And part of that might mean when I say jeopardy, it could be actually practicing an element that feels high risk, but actually is structured and safe, but gives them a reflective space. So one of the things, so for example, recent programs I've designed, I'd like to use actors a lot as part mm -hmm. of the delivery. So we might talk about, say, a coaching framework or a certain presentation technique. And it's like, great, okay. We've talked about this. So it feels like from an academic perspective, this is landing, you're kind of picking it up. Well, let's put it into action. Let's move from the hypothetical to the real. You're going to walk into this scenario in the next three to four minutes. This is the criteria or the kind of concept that's in place. It's going to be actor in there who has a role to play. You've got to kind of work through this scenario with them and get them to the point where you've applied the framework, the tool, whatever it might be. And having to do that, it gives people two things. One is a sense of jeopardy because they have to perform. They don't want to embarrass themselves. And then two, it gives them a point of reference. I like to say confidence is like a table. It needs legs, i.e. examples, to stand up and, and have a sense of power. And creating opportunities for jeopardy give people that confidence from the lived examples they have in session to actually do that and then apply it differently when they get out of session afterwards. So, yeah. Mm. And do you think those principles need to be applied more because now we have this global companies with diverse employees and team members and it's still hybrid some some meetings are held on yeah. zoom and yeah. so if if you're a team leader and uh, do you just come there and say this is the agenda this is what we're going to do goodbye or do you get people engaged in, and use the same facilitation principles Again, yeah, that, that that term, that word offering, moving people from being an audience to an author of their own experience. I'm big on that. So um, to your point around diverse groups and audiences, it would be a waste if, say, there's one voice, one dynamic projecting out. Like I've, I've led teams where they've been based different locations, different work styles, and being able to draw on the, that their mix of experiences and expertise has only aided the teams we've worked in and the projects we've worked on. Um, so one of my favorite things is actually to say, look, you know, um, this is your team. What's the values? What's the kind of, I suppose, architecture of, of, of what we're going to deliver on and the expectations around it. So going back to that point earlier, what do we want to encourage? What do we want to accept? What will we not ignore as a behavior or a culture within this team that we want to kind of strive towards and say to people, give them the ownership for it. That is just like laissez-faire as, as a leader or manager if, in the roles I've been in say, well, actually, you choose. I, I will abdicate accountability or responsibilities because it's your choice. Don't worry. I'll, I'll take the paycheck of this, the manager or leader, but you might take all the risk. Um, mm -hmm. But I really like the idea of um, so people talk about tight, loose, tight. So being tight on the outcome you want to get to as a group. Mm -hmm. Loose on, okay, there isn't one route or one solution to that. Let's collaborate and build one out and then tight on the measure of the outcome. So how we actually assess whether we're successful or not. So as a, as a leader or when I work with leaders, I find that they're more comfortable with the notion, okay, I'm happy to be tight on the goal or aim. Um, I'm happy to be tight on the measures with some input there, but I'm very, very comfortable being loose, i.e. empowering my teams to kind of pick up and run with whatever the route, the solution might be and offer it themselves. And that's an ethos for me. You talk about that's how you draw the value from working with diverse teams, and getting the best from them. I think it, it's the only way to be. Mm, mm. So that everyone feels like not only can they contribute, but that they are whatever creative idea they have is, yeah. is, is heard. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Sneak and the work that you did there. Yeah, so um, uh, Sneak is, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, first of all, the name stands for So Now You Know. It's like, uh, essentially, it's a So Now oh. You Know, yeah. Um, so it's essentially a, a, a developer security platform that, uh, that provides products that mean when you're building out websites or apps, the code that's behind it, just making sure it's safe, it's not vulnerable to any risks or say any leaks or data being at risk and so on. Um, the stuff I was doing there as part of like a learning team that was building out um, some of the standard stuff you see on startups and scale ups of like nuts and bolts programs, like onboarding, stuff like that. And then more latterly, some of the management leadership um, 
programs um leading people program was one of the key ones we had there and some of the wider digital learning stuff that we're trying to roll out as well it was a great example to some of your questions earlier around an organization that was diverse based across the globe tel aviv london and boston being like the three initial hubs and then growing exponentially out of that during the time i was there i came in it was around four or five hundred people it got to 1500 in 18 months um it just experienced that kind of cliche hyper growth you hear about scale-ups um but the great thing during my time that they held on to and it links into some of the stuff you ask about around culture and leadership is um you know they, they had a great way in terms of attracting people who are really you know passionate high intellect um high expertise but also very humble in terms of how they approach what they did which isn't you can't assume that's going to be the case especially in organizations that are moving that fast growing so quickly um but they kind of did a great job of holding on to their values and kind of culturally around them how how people operate and behave um so yeah that was the kind i was working there up until around april time of 2023 and just okay. like there just over two and two years four months i think it was so yeah that, that was kind of sneak and then prior to that kind of different managed consultancies scale-ups and startups and other bits and pieces um and all sorts of kind of different cultural environments as well in that spectrum mm. what would you say are the top two reasons they grew so quickly within the 18 month period i would say you know having a product that's useful and relevant so the way I used to frame the onboarding when we first kind of started running was, and this is kind of this evolved, but one of the phrases I like to use is like, you're making the digital world a safer place for generations to come. That's what their products, that's what they do. And it isn't like the official tagline or mission and vision, but it is the reality of what something like that does. So it's a fantastic space in terms of growth and and where the products were were helping to serve us as like consumers and organizations within that that's the first thing and then secondly um it was ambitious um and the, and the kind of people attracted and the expertise it brought in there helped exponentially grow out that kind of that hyper growth or encourage that hyper growth mm-hmm. um and as an organization like i said it kind of tried to hold on to those culture and values which is very difficult um in, in when, you, when you grow so fast but um those are kind of key pieces like how to products in an area that like kind of we're all conscious of our own digital security as individuals but all organizations it's it's critical to their success to be able to manage that effectively so it was, it was providing a fantastic service and then um you know um having a bold vision in terms of growth and then the expertise and people it attracted to, to deliver on that as well mm. i recently heard that we focus more on process processes than people when it should be people rather than processes do you mm. think they also applied that principle um i think um in terms of I, i've got a theory around kind of like with big tech organizations of like what you have is like a coming together of like the reason you're there or not not the reason you're there or one is there is solely about this but a product has evolved and been built that was built via say agile methodologies expertise and processes Mm. that leads to certain cultural conditions that you have to be cognizant of so the ones that thrive and and really do well the likes of a sneak or other organizations you could look up it's when they combine that process and people piece so when they have it's it's a bit glib what i'm about to say but when they have a heart in terms of how they treat some of their employees and kind of notions around that um i think where um talking more broadly uh where people say about where process triumphs over people being a negative thing is when perhaps um uh organizations lose sight around actually you know um there's certain things that motivate people one of the key things is around what they are, are they contributing to something bigger than themselves that uh, what's the relationship with their manager what's their view of senior leadership and, and the trust within that um if people if organizations lose sight of that um trust can deteriorate quite quickly and that's where suddenly you you fall into the realms of like bigger challenges around retention attraction um wider performance as well um so that's as why well, i'd say like those features around say managing trust 
having a big vision that people buy into being some bigger than themselves and the dynamic between their own immediately leader and manager is quite critical mm, mm. what would be your last words of wisdom to a leader who leads a global team a leader who leads a global team mm-hmm. wherever possible if you're making a big decision take a look around the room and if everyone's from the same region or similar region, and especially if they're all from the same or similar region as you, you perhaps haven't got the right people in the room to make a big decision. Um, you see it all the time in organizations where it's, it's just the nature of like certain businesses where certain geos or regions, you know, certain execs or, or leaders get concentrated in them. But what that can sometimes lead to is inadvertent groupthink around big decisions and so i always say to like these managers is like like how how big is your tent like how how many people are in there and like who is in there in terms of representation from different ranks and roles and different dynamics and views it helps aid your decision making but even your implementation afterwards for considerations and stuff you perhaps haven't thought of um so that's always my advice look around the room and if they are Either if everyone's a bit too similar, whether in terms of role, background, expertise, demographic, have a think on that. Is that something you're looking to encourage or aspire towards? Or is that just something you just accepted and stumbled upon? Because one might be in service to you. The other actually might be doing a disservice to you and the teams you're leading. Mm-hmm. Which is the self awareness piece as well. If they actually do take the time to look around, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And as well, let's be honest, mm. we get security from the familiar. Oh, I look around and kind of I trust these people. It's, They've done it's a great human decisions. nature, yeah. of course, of course. Yeah. And it's I always say, you know what? It's actually easy. It's almost like a shortcut. It, <laughs> we all think the same. <laughs> and we are all we all like conditions for cognitive biases that way for those shortcuts. Right. It's just the nature yeah. of it. It's it's human nature for sure. And what what would you say about self awareness? Self awareness. What would I say about it? I would say, um, you know, it doesn't operate in a vacuum. It, it, otherwise, that's praise. Like because self awareness without feedback, without kind of soundboarding, and I used the word validate. You know, earlier it applies here. Validating what you believe to be truths doesn't work if it's in a vacuum and so you need feedback so and sometimes self-awareness is painful because the reality is sometimes you might hold off a mirror to, someone might help you hold off a mirror to yourself you might not like what you see but it's necessary for growth you know without without any feedback there can be no growth um so yeah it's, it's critical in terms of professional growth mm, it can certainly be uncomfortable yeah for sure Patrick, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I've enjoyed my conversation with you. Super, likewise. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you to Cara the dog for not barking. Appreciate you, Cara. Thank you for being so good (laughs) during our recording. And before you go, I believe you have a freebie for our listeners. Yeah, so um, I always say to people, uh, I mentioned about bringing your whole self, your most authentic self to work. I do work with an organization called NACOA. I'm an ambassador for a charity called NACOA in the UK. They do some fantastic work in um, the space for for children affected by alcoholic homes. Um, And I just like, I just wanted to give a shout out to them. And as well, if you're curious to find out more about them, um, you could check out their information online. They're always looking to get more people involved in the cause and how and where they can, I suppose, rise or raise awareness around what they're trying to do. Um, it's a massively underrepresented organization in terms of dialogue and and, and politically and socially in the UK. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm happy if anyone wants to hear more about them to reach out and I can connect you with them. And, yeah, it's just a terrific organization. Yes, yes, absolutely. They certainly could use more resources. And what about Hyper Island? So Hyper Island, it's um. So you you said about the freebies. I strongly yes. recommend for anyone if you're in, uh, the learning the leadership management space, check out their resources and tools. Uh, they've got a fantastic toolbox with lots of different activities and exercises you can steal or borrow from. But also some of just their general resources and content is just very thought provoking in terms of actually 
going back to some of what we were saying earlier, testing your assumptions, asking good questions, looking to explore and actually find out more from your own teams. They've got some really interesting ideas and resources there. So if you check out the the link uh, in the show notes, it'll give you a bit more information about where to find out more about them as well. Mm -hmm. I'll certainly put the link on the show notes. Test your assumptions, ask good questions. Can you imagine how many misunderstandings we could avoid if we did that? I I I think that every day just for myself. So yeah, <laughs> but it's um we're only human. But at least yes, surprise you that you can do it better. Yeah, the self awareness really does help. Thank you so much, Patrick Wolaki, the learning so and Amanda. leadership professional. Thank you very much. Before you go, please give us your website and social media handles so we can contact you. Yes, yeah, so, so my website is bite and build. Dot com so that's my coaching website for working with esports teams and pro gamers and, and coaching in general and uh my handle really for social media the only one really to reach out on is kind of uh, i suppose my linkedin which is the link standard linkedin address and then forward slash malarkey pj which is my initials and that name surname and initials malarkey pj so yeah um come find me i'd love to connect Yes, I'll certainly put that on the show notes as well. When I looked you up on LinkedIn, because the, the first Patrick Malarkey that showed up was a very young guy. And I'm thinking, yes, I did not assume your surname to be that popular and to actually match the name and say name. It's literally, I, it's the West of Ireland thing. So my dad's from ah. County Mayo in the West of Ireland. My mother's from Armagh in the North. But um, it's, uh, we went, I don't think this was, this bit was recorded before we came on here, but like, it's it's a hugely popular name in the West, and it's like it's the name means nonsense notionally, or kind of like all oh, that malarkey is is like a phrase in, in North America and Canada. Malarkey. So yeah, <laughs> malarkey means nonsense. Thank yeah. you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> this has been fun. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify, and stay tuned for more episodes to come.